Good afternoon, and welcome to this conversation about what people of faith can do to strengthen our democracy. My name is Martha Zoller. We have organized this through the Kartner Center, and I'm a conservative activist, a broadcaster, and a person who's been involved in politics for more than 30 years in Georgia. Together with my colleague, Dr. Rashad Ritchie, uh, we are co-leads of the Georgia Democracy Resilience Project. Um, we look forward to talking with a group of cross-partisan influencers at all levels who share a concern about polarization in our politics and who are united around the common principles of the democratic process. Uh, so here's the thing, uh, Martha and I agree on very little, uh, but we do agree that democracy is sacred and should be protected. Uh, there is no finality in democracy. We we'll always get another opportunity cause up the vote. That vote empowers everybody to have a chance to select their elected leaders. These uh, programs exist also in Arizona, Florida, and North Carolina. Uh, I'm a broadcaster, university professor, and I'm also an advocate for more progressive policies uh, than my dear sister Martha on the right. But we agree that we should debate these policies in civility and not in conflict. Um, we do agree that in order to fulfill the great promise to the Republic that we must reach across partisan aisles intentionally. We must find solutions inside of disagreement and we must do it in ways that are healthy and uh, this is why I'm delighted as, a, uh, as an individual uh, who is a late church leader like Martha uh, to be part of this conversation today about faith and to help move forward our democracy. The Carter Center, as you know, is dedicated to this principle. Uh, we have always known the Carter Center to be dedicated to principles like uh, wage, earning, uh, fighting diseases, uh, building hope around the world. Before the 2020 elections, there was no need for the Carter Center to do this kind of work inside of the country, out of America. Uh, but the sobering reflection is after now. Uh, so we are working in a way that's very intentional, not only in our overseas uh, capacity, uh, but that knowledge base has come here to the United States. Rule of law, human rights, mental health programming, conflict resolution, democracy overall. To these ends, we're delighted today to be able to talk about the role faith plays in the conflict with one of the world's foremost experts, Reverend Gary Mason is a pastor and a peacemaker. He has spent his life working in divided societies. He is, was honored by Her Majesty the Queen for his work in his native Northern Ireland. And he works today also in Israel and Palestine. He is the founder of Rethinking Conflict and he is a frequent visitor to the United States. We're looking forward to talking to him about the lessons he's learned in other countries and how they apply here in the United States and the steps that each of us can take. That's what's really important. But before we go forward on this and turn it over to Gary, please know that you can ask questions through the Q&A function. There's a lot of us here today, so we'll only be able to get to a few of the questions, but we look forward to hearing Reverend Gary Mason speak. Thank you, Reverend. Okay, thank you, Martha. Thank you, Rashad. Nice to see you both. I was just smiling earlier there uh, with Martha and saying this has been a very United States day for me, and you may ask why, Gary. Uh, I've just come from a meeting with 15 uh, young emerging leaders both Republican and Democrat, who are on a European tour that began in Brussels, now in Belfast, and then to Dublin. But it's not just a US day, it's actually a Georgia day, because over lunch to my left-hand side was a young woman from Arkansas who did her degree, her undergraduate studies at Georgia Tech. And to the right-hand side of me over lunch was another young woman who has a position on Atlanta City Council. So. This is my third Georgia experience today. Let me begin by quoting a United States journalist who says to all of us, in order to disagree well, you must understand well. In order to disagree well, you must understand well. 
The three areas I spent most of my life working in, apart from my native island of Ireland, uh, has been the United States. I've hosted thousands of pastors here in the Irish context, uh, both conservative and both liberal, as well as hosting a thousand Israelis and Palestinians in Belfast. I'm literally just back from Israel and Palestine on Sunday evening. And in many ways, I describe myself as a child of conflict. I remember when I was a little boy in 1972, we had a terrorist incident every 40 minutes. I remember going to sleep at night so many times with bombs and shootings in the distance and sometimes not so distant. Northern Ireland is an incredibly tiny space. You could probably tuck it into a pocket of uh, northeast Georgia. To be honest, you can drive north, south, east and west inside a two hour period. But over that 30 year internal civil war that we experienced, uh, we had 47,000 injuries, uh, 36,000 shootings, 22,000 armed robberies, 30,000 political prisoners went through our penal system with 16,000 bombings and almost 4,000 deaths. I guess to the American mind, you may say, Gary, those are pretty minuscule figures. Let me extrapolate them. And to simply say this, that if the Northern Irish conflict had have taken place in the United States over a 30 year period, you would have had 700,000 dead, 6 million political prisoners, 9 million injuries, 7 million shootings, and 3 million bombings. I often smile when I'm in the United States in relation to sometimes your Republican and Democrat divisions, which we're all well aware of on this Zoom conversation today. But I do remind Americans, because literally in a few weeks' time, on April the 10th, is the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. And so if you're a Republican on here tonight or you're a Democrat, let me say that both those political traditions contributed to a peace agreement, which has been, to my mind, the most successful piece of US foreign policy in the last 50 years, bringing to an end almost a 800 year conflict going back to the 12th century. I remember way back in May, 2021, if you're a follower of Middle East politics and particularly Israeli-Palestinian politics, uh, for the first time really since the foundation of the state of Israel, there was serious internal violence in what is defined as the seven mixed cities in Israel, cities that house both Jews and both Arabs. And I was speaking to a close colleague of mine who was the senior Israeli negotiator at Camp David. And I ended up writing an article for the Times of Israel. And if you're interested in reading it, we can't get it into the chat, but if you just simply Google later on, uh, Times of Israel, Gary Mason. And I tried to address a concern that I had about what was happening in relation to Israel internally. Because Jews and Arabs, for the first time since the foundation of the state of Israel in these mixed cities, were killing each other. And I highlighted that my concern in that region was, if you didn't bring this under control, you're going to end up with a series of mini Belfasts all over Israel. Looking at our conflict, which began, as many of you know, in the summer of 1969, common wisdom of the day, I mean the, the experts of the day, the politicians of the day, the journalists of the day, the political commentators of the day were saying, it'll be over by Christmas. The operation didn't officially end until midnight, July the 31st, 2007. It was the longest continuous military deployment in the British Army's history. And looking back at our peace process, one of the key concepts we have seen to building peace and maintaining peace is the role of both political and civic leadership. And in that area of civic leadership, I particularly include faith leaders or faith actors. Because leaders in all sides of our conflict realize, yes, we can continue to kill each other for another 50 years. We've been doing it for hundreds of years. 
but leadership emerged in both our communities that allowed people to actually face down their rivals. And it's interesting when I host Israelis and Palestinians in Belfast, they often say to me there are five lessons they take from the Irish peace process. Uh, I want to suggest to you that these are five lessons that have applicability in your space. Because I remember back in 2014 when I was corresponding with a colleague in New York over a number of theological issues, the word civil war didn't even come into the conversation. But it did deeply disturb me prior to the last election in the United States in 2020 that both conservative and liberal commentators we're using that phrase in a multiplicity of different ways. So five lessons that Israelis and Palestinians would say to me, and we can have a conversation about these. They say political leadership is really essential to achieving peace and maintaining peace. That leaders on all sides of any conflicted spaces must sincerely believe that change is actually preferable to the status quo and be willing to take risks to achieve peace, while also providing a vision that will ensure you maintain the confidence of your grassroots supporters. In the early 1990s, the phrase we used here was, we had a mutually hurting stalemate. So what does that mean, Gary? It simply means this. The British Army were not going to defeat the IRA. The IRA were never going to defeat the British Army, one of the most efficient armies in the world. And the pro-British non-state actors who were involved in political violence were not going to defeat the IRA. So there emerged in both our opposing traditions on this island. Leaders that said we need to create an environment for peace. So a desire really, I guess, for a better future encouraged leaders to take the risks face down accusations of betrayal for within their own communities to achieve peace. Every Israeli and Palestinian has been with me in Belfast, and I dare suggest subconsciously both Republicans and Democrats will say, mm, what you're saying, Gary, here also applies to here in the United States. They say to me, Gary, you just don't understand. We don't trust each other. And I remind them in the late 1980s, when I was a a younger clergy person, when the number of us reached out to those who were pursuing violence, there was no trust. In fact, I often say in some of those first meetings, even as a clergy person, we were in rooms with people who hated each other. But I often remind you that a lack of trust between opposing sides is an inevitable feature of building peace but it cannot be used as a justification for not beginning the process. So putting it very categorically, trust never begins at the beginning of a process. Only over time, many times meaning secretly, making and meeting commitments and by building confidence through concrete actions. We also find that attempts to resolve the conflict through military force were ultimately futile and did not result in sustainable security for either community. So it was simply like this. You heard one of us, we heard one of you. I mean, as a little boy in the 70s, I knew, sitting watching the news with my mom and dad, if I heard, oh, two Catholics were murdered on hour ago, I knew by the time I woke up the next morning, took my school satchel in my back to go to school, I knew two Protestants would have been murdered. So in our space, security was only achieved and I want you to hear this, when dialogue was prioritized and the root causes of the conflict were addressed. So I say to Republicans and Democrats, um, what are the root causes of your differences? How are you addressing them? Uh, and let me assure you, you will not resolve it on social media. This is not going to be resolved through tweets or Facebook. It has to be resolved through concrete human engagement. I mean, the Jewish theologian Abraham Joshua Hitchell, one of you in American, said that dehumanization precedes genocide. And so that's why I want to commend both those on the conservative side and on the liberal side 
that you're coming together to at least engage with one another, humanize one another. Because if we're going to look at this theologically difficult as it may be, all of us in this, myself included, Republicans, Democrats, those who maybe don't even want to call themselves Republicans and Democrats, all of us have the imprint of the image of God on our foreheads. One of the key concepts we learned in our peace process was something called the political peace process versus the social peace process. And so by that social peace process, that includes people like uh, Martha and Rashad. It includes civic actors, women's groups, academics, business people, clergy, journalists, people involved in the media. Because as we all know, we live in this kind of sort of 140 character world. Put it in a tweet, stick it in a billboard or an I-75. Let's just do a 15 second advertisement. Reducing the world's wisdom to something pithy and sometimes, as we all know, pretty trite. But interestingly, in the Babylonian Talmud, the rabbis actually posed a similar question to those of us who are fascinated and obsessed with tweets. They said this, is there any way we can distill the essentials of Judaism in 140 characters? I think the best tweet in relation to those 140 characters is in Micah 6 and verse 8. Where it simply says, he has told you, O mortal, what is good? What does the Lord require of you to do justice, love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? To quote Abraham Herschel again, where he says, the shallowness of our moral comprehension, the incapacity to sense the depth of misery caused by our own failures, is a simple fact of fallen humanity, which no explanation can justify or hide. So as I look at the church in the West, in the US and in my British, Irish or European space, I want to suggest to you that pastorally, I believe the church does a pretty good job. We're good at baptisms, marriage counseling, weddings, funerals, pastoral care. But I do want to ask the question, what is the role of the church in a divided society like yours? And how does the church act in a prophetic manner? Now, if you look at the minor prophets, they didn't class themselves as superstars. Most of the time, they were standing on the sidelines of society and critiquing society. I mean, so a prophet is a person who feels fiercely. God puts this burden on their soul. They're bowed and stunned at humanity's disobedience. So prophecy is the voice God has lent to the silent agony. God is raging in the prophet's words. So I'm going to ask you some questions. I'm not going to resolve the dilemma of the United States tonight. As God looks on the United States today, is God agonizing over what is happening? As a preacher of another generation said, you preach with a newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other hand. The United States, more than any other country, apart from my own soil and space here, has influenced me profoundly. I'm ordained 36 years this coming May. And so I want to ask in your divided space, what does it look like to do justice, to do kindness? And to be humble before your God. As one evangelical commentator said there recently, politics has a strong grip on our hearts. The gospel's grip should be stronger. As I often remind folk, politics is temporal. The gospel is eternal. So let's do the Nike thing, the kind of just do it. So just do justice. I know your nation struggles, so I'm not here to make you feel guilty, but I do know this. I do know what toxic religion and toxic politics can do in any space if it is allowed to take root. As Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote, the line separating good and evil, 
passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. So we both Republicans and Democrats should acknowledge, first of all, that you're fallen individuals and you struggle with sin. Like all of us, because we believe these sacred texts that have shaped your nation and shaped my nation. That is what is being said. That we are all fallen humanity. So what does kindness or mercy mean? Just do it. The word Micah uses for mercy is the Hebrew word hachid. In the Old Testament or in the Hebrew Bible, it's more or less the word most closely associated with God's loving kindness expressed in the covenant. So in reality, it's the basis of his relationship with human beings. My concern about your space is this. If things go wrong, and I do remind American colleagues this, that this is not Vietnam, Afghanistan, or Iraq, something that takes place five or 6,000 miles away. It's also not the Civil War. So this is not Northern states versus the Southern states. This is a series of mini Belfasts all over the United States. This is what I lived through for 30 years, knowing the person in the next street may want to kill me because I'm Protestant or because I'm Unionist or because I'm Republican or because I'm Catholic. And the trauma you will pass from generation to generation to generation. I led a delegation just two weeks ago in Israel and Palestine of American religious leaders from the state of Florida. And we visited Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem, as you know, means I will give them an everlasting name. But the trauma that has been passed down from generation to generation through the shore, through the Holocaust, is still evident there within Jewish society. And so I want to say to leaders, both Republican and Democrat religious leaders, I'm putting it in very blunt Irish terms, you need to bust your gut to make sure the United States does not spill into violence over political disagreement. Why? Because you want to pass trauma to your children and to your children's children and your children's children's children. Northern Ireland, 25 years since the Good Friday Agreement, many Americans say to me, I'm so glad, Gary, it's all sorted out. Well, yes and no. One in five ex-prisoners are drinking themselves to death. We have the highest dosage of antidepressants in Western Europe and one of the highest in the world. One in three people living here have been affected by the conflict. So what does it mean to walk humbly with God in the midst of all these political divisions? The, the late Jonathan Sachs, the brilliant Jewish theologian who I had the opportunity to meet in London before he died of cancer, talks about Moses being described as a very humble person, uh, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. But kind of tongue-in-cheek, let me say this, I think by today's standards, Moses was wrongly advised. I mean, Moses should have hired an agent, uh, sharpened up his image, let slip some calculated indiscretions about his conversations with the Almighty, and obviously sold his story to the press for a six-figure sum. With any luck, he might have landed up with his own television chat show, dispensing wisdom to those willing to bear their souls to the watching millions. Moses could have had his 15 minutes of fame. But instead... He had to settle for the lesser consolation of 3,000 years of moral influence. So let me ask you a question. With all these political divisions, with tweets, mean conversations, do you want to settle for 15 minutes of your own side cheering you from the bleachers? Or do you want to settle for decades? or centuries of lasting fame within an eternal context. 
And to do that, we need to build humility. An article in the American newspaper not so long ago said humility is not what it used to be. This whole concept of it's mandatory for politicians, athletes, celebrities to say, I am so honored. A soap opera actress on tour is humbled by the outpouring of love from her fans. Comedians are humbled by big laughs. Yoga practitioners are humbled by achieving difficult poses. Are they really humbled? Because many of them seem exceedingly proud of themselves, hashtagging their humility, their status, their success, their generosity, their moral superiority. It's pretty different to the first century Nazarene. And Paul writes, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to their own interests, but also the interests of others. Because look at this person who made themselves nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. I haven't written this down, but let me transliterate this and probably annoy a few of you, but preachers are meant to do that. I remember I had a preacher in the United States saying to one of my former congregations, Gary is not here to make you happy. Gary is here to make you holy. There is an absolute profound difference. So let me try to translate. And I'm just doing this at the top of my head, having come into my head. Philippians 2 and 3 in the United States. As Republicans and Democrats, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Hold on, Paul. Are you asking me to consider a Democrat better than me, a Republican? A Republican better than a Democrat? Well, let's hear what Paul says, not me. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. So you're asking me as a Republican, Paul, through God, to look out for the interests of Democrats and vice versa. Because Jesus made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. In the mid-1980s, when we were in the midst of hell in our conflict, a group of us came together and we produced a document that was entitled For God and His Glory Alone. Affirming most of all that Jesus Christ was Lord. That despite our competing political and constitutional differences, and we moved through a study pack of 10 concepts biblically, we looked at this whole concept of what does it really mean to love your neighbor? What does forgiveness mean in a very, very contested space? What does reconciliation mean? Not some cheap, trashy reconciliation where we do an emotional hug on television. But what does biblical reconciliation actually mean and how do we achieve that? How do we wrestle in contested spaces with those words of Jesus? Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called the children of God. We wrestled with citizenship. I mean, in our space, we can designate as both British and Irish. But we had to ask the question, is British, Irish, American, Israeli, Palestinian, German, French citizenship eternal? The answer is no, because while I may hold a British or an Irish passport, Paul assures me and assures all of you that your citizenship is actually in heaven, which should supersede any political identity. As I said, politics are temporal. The gospel is eternal. What does it mean, we said, to wrestle for justice and righteousness in very, very contested spaces. 
So I want to suggest that what you're doing, both conservatives and liberals, Democrats and Republicans, is the right thing to do despite the opposition. But it's not simple because I see uh, the braver angels there uh, during your Super Bowl had the advertisement, Jesus loved the people we hate. And there was backlash to that commercial from both the left and the right. No one has a monopoly on this. They might not have got it totally right, but I often ask myself the question when I meet someone with whom I disagree. I try to look at this person's heart. I mean, to quote John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, if your heart is as my heart, give me your hand. Looking beyond the person's political identity to their identity as a human being. Let me finish with a story. I work with Harvard University on a program which is pretty much under the radar. It's a negotiation program for Palestinians, Israelis, and international diplomats. They spend four or five days with me in Belfast and then a couple of days in Dublin. And they meet all the key actors here, those who are involved in violence. They meet American officials, Irish, British, peacemakers, religious leaders, victims, etc. And I remember at the end of this, a young Palestinian woman, as we gathered in a religious setting, come up to me and said, you know, Gary, I've really, really enjoyed this week. But she said with fire in her belly and fire in her eyes, she said, but I still believe as a Palestinian, an armed struggle. I said, I understand, but I, I disagree. But I know where you're coming from. And I said to her, just as long as you realize that your armed struggle, which involves violence, may result in the death of those two people over there who were two Israeli Jews. Because I'd watched them during the week. They were friends. They'd laughed together. They'd hugged each other. They'd gone out for drinks together. And she turned to me and she said, you know, Gary, I didn't think of it like that. I said, I know you didn't. And I think sometimes in the volatility of your space and in my space, we sometimes don't bring biblical principles to the language we use. Disagree. Republicans and Democrats disagree well. When I'm in the United States, as I alluded to my last seminar, I stay with both Republicans and Democrats. And I teasingly tease you Americans say, you know, shockingly, I find them pretty normal people. So the question I want to ask people of faith, if this goes wrong in the United States, as it has gone wrong in so many other spaces, where does that leave the free world? And where does that leave a nation which has had a profound influence on planet Earth, particularly in a faith-based perspective? You can't see all my library behind me here, but if you could, I can assure you of this. The vast majority of books that are behind me, and there's over 2,000, 70% of them are by American Christians. Guard on influence and hold it tightly. We'll have a conversation. I'll pass back to my colleagues. <laughs> that was uh, remarkable. Uh, thank you for your continued leadership, your courage, and um, your effectiveness, very effective um, at your job and your calling. I have some questions in the chat. What I would like to do is take a quick personal preference and pose. Um, there's a word. Uh, Reverend Mason, Christotes, which means kindness and good. And that word kindness is basically an illumination of being decent to people, even if individuals disagree. And it seems as if we have lost that dynamic in our political conversations. Our politics has almost taken the place of our faith uh, to where they are congruent in passion, uh, disagreement, alignment, and disalignment. What? can we do to rehumanize from the process of dehumanization? Yeah. I think lessons, Rashid, across the world. I mean, language, I mean, again, quoting Abraham Joshua there, he had that phrase where he said, 
it was words, not machines that created Auschwitz. Mm. So long before the Nazi tanks ruled into France or Belgium or Poland, there was a language there that allowed this to happen. And that's why Jonathan Sachs uses that word linguistic violence. So how do we disagree with each other in a kind way? How do we look out for that other person? I mean, Rashid and Martha, I am sure both of you as human beings, when you look at your children or your children's children, you want those children to do well. The problem is what we're dumping on our children. And I see this still in my space. You're going to be passing this from generation to generation to generation. I think almost unknowingly, Americans are creating a toxic space that's not going to end next year or the year after or the year after. I mean, come to Belfast uh, at some stage, and uh, we've talked about the Carter Center bringing a delegation here. We still, still, 25 years after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, have high walls mm. because people haven't trusted each other enough. Some have. So people, I would suggest, for she need to look down the corridors of time. And when all of us have left planet Earth, what is our legacy? for our children and our children's children. And I think hearing the other person's story, I know I mentioned the last time, how do we use sacred space well? Mm. I mean, most of our churches, and I know this in the United States, putting it bluntly cost an absolute fortune to build. Are we using sacred space well? So if I was pastoring in North Georgia, I no doubt they have Republicans and Democrats in my space, I would say, look, Let's hear a person of faith who's a Republican. Let's hear their heart. Let's hear their story. Let's hear what shaped them as a human being. And do that vice versa. But it's almost, I mean, it's, I mentioned the last time there, Rashid, it's, it's Jonathan Hyatt's article there in the Atlantic where he says, why has America been so uniquely stupid in the last 10 years? <laughs> and he talks about these social darts. So sometimes, Martha and Rashid, Republicans and Democrats I talk to, it's their own tribe they're more concerned with, who are flipping what he calls social darts into a person's back because you dare to reach out to the other. So let me tell you those people are wrong. Who says they're wrong? Jesus says they're wrong. Let me give you one example. Jesus encounters the Roman centurion. And I contextualize that. The Jews are under occupation. The jackboot of the most efficient military machine on planet Earth has their jackboot on the neck of the Jews. And Jesus reaches out to the occupying force. But more outrageous than that, he says, I have not seen so great a faith in all of Israel. Now, in your context, where there's no occupying force, that really would be like a Republican saying, my democratic friend, I have not seen so great a faith in all of the United States and vice versa. You can't deny that. I mean, you're going to deny that. You're starting, to deny, you're starting to deny Jesus' words. So we need to contextualize what is the important and how do we do that? So I encourage engagement. It's engagement is not endorsement because I engage. I mean, if Jesus had to work in that principle, I mean, Jesus engaged with people with whom he fundamentally disagreed. Explorative religious leaders, Roman centurions. Yeah. We need to create those spaces to allow us. And, and I say to the church, we should be at the front of that. That's powerful. One, one more question directly from one of the audience members. As and I quote, it seems to me that the church faith leaders in particular have gone silent. Christianity itself has so many factions and varying beliefs, Democrat, Republican, or otherwise. Do you see a path forward uh, for unification first within the body of Christ? Okay. Okay. I think if we we're going to wait for unification, uh, I am in definitely six foot under, and everyone listening to me tonight is in exactly the same position. So in our space, uh, I mean, I very much, you know, grew up very much in a kind of evangelical tradition within my space and it shaped me. Uh, but we twinned with Catholic clergy because the bigger goal 
was life. I mean, a, a rabbi there recently in Israel uh, who's now dead said, the sanctity of life is more important than the sanctity of land. Life to all of us and all our faith traditions, we all want to live. And so can we say, are we able to overcome these barriers? Primarily to stop America descending into violence. My concern about the US, and I've said this before, is when our conflict broke out, there was no weaponry here. We went to shock the US to get some, uh, South Africa and Eastern Europe, because that's the spaces that had the weaponry. My concern is, Martha and Rashid, if it goes wrong in your space, you're into a bloodbath overnight. And we all know, I mean, William Iden said, 1st of September, 1939, those to whom evil is done will do evil in return. So you'll create a cycle of violence that could be very, very difficult to stop. And that's why faith leaders prophetically need to be in the public space. We're not asking to say, uh, we agree on this is my atonement theory or your atonement theory, or this is my view of the second coming. Your mantra should be, how do we preserve life? which is the most precious thing to all of us. And your politics, like our politics, could end up creating a context where you're going to have serious losses of human life, mm. which no one in their right mind wants this. I think we need to analyze this. I mean, I hear some trite remarks in America, and I mean, uh, somebody in D.C., and I'll not be naming them, they are a member of a political party, said, well, maybe we need a civil war to get this all over. I said, hold on. Do you know what that means? That means that your two beautiful daughters in a shopping mall in D.C. could be caught up in an explosion. Oh, I didn't think of it like that. I said, I know you didn't, because if you did, you wouldn't have thought of it. So we need to analyze the repercussions of where the divisions in the United States could actually lead. And I think the church needs to do that. So I tell you, the uh, questions are are many, um, and I loved many of the things you said, uh, and I think it's kind of how we characterize ourselves. I look at myself as, while a lot of people like to define me as a conservative activist, I'm a wife, a mother, I'm a Christian first, I'm a wife, a mother, a grandmother, then I'm an American, then I'm a Georgian, then I'm a Republican. So seventh, eighth, ninth down the list is my conservative viewpoints, even though I work very hard on that. But I'm also a creative person. And one of the questions that came from the audience uh, was about how artists and poets can help. The world seems to be on fire in so many ways. It's no longer possible to take a break from news. So how is it that creative people can help in this kind of reunification? Yeah, yeah. So if you had asked me that question more beforehand, and I'll actually flip this in. I was in uh, Israel and Palestine, as you know, they're leading a delegation of religious leaders from Florida. And we visited the Yitzhak Rabin Museum. Uh, Yitzhak Rabin was shot dead by a very extreme right-wing settler because he wanted to make peace with his enemies. But if you Google this later, I can't remember all the poem. I actually took a photograph uh, and the poem was entitled, The Place We Are Right. And then it just leads on a little bit. Um, and I, I, I will find it uh, hopefully before we're over, but we always work on the assumption that my place is right. And there's no room for change. There's no room for flexibility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So poetry undoubtedly plays a space in this here. Um, Belfast, if you're bored later on again, Google YouTube, Belfast murals. A lot of the murals or wall paintings in this space were militaristic, antagonistic, towards the other person. And in 2001, I got a grant from a government body of about $40,000, because at that stage I was working very much in the inner city, very much at the sharp face, uh, to kind of re-image some of these areas after the conflict. So we come up with a brilliant name for this project. You'll love this. It's after the Pink Floyd song, The Writing's Not on the Wall. So that's what we call <laughs> the project. So we began to take down some of these murals. and. Uh, I very much came to faith reading C.S. Lewis. Uh, C.S. Lewis was born in Belfast. I see his home every Tuesday night at my rugby club where I play squash. It's just facing that. And so we did a mural of C.S. Lewis, uh, The Land, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, The Chronicles of Narnia, et cetera, et cetera. And some of the BBC said, I want to interview you, Gary, 
beside the mural. And a typical cynical reporter said to me, well, what difference does this make? I said, well, let me tell you what difference it makes. I said, in that little house there, in a conflict zone, this little girl lives there. Of the first five or six years of her life, when she woke up every morning and pulled her bedroom curtains, she saw two hooded gunmen with two semi armalite rifles dressed in dark clothes. I said, today, she sees Aslan the land. She sees the land, the witch, and the wardrobe. She sees the wardrobe someone's going into, and she sees a picture of C.S. Lewis. So just mischievously, I asked the cynical reporter back, do you think that makes a difference to this little girl? And kind of begrudgingly, Marty said, mm, I guess it does. Of course it does. Images make a difference. So undoubtedly, artists and poets have a role to play. There's absolutely no question about that. And maybe a Republican artist and a Democrat artist come together to look at some symbolism that would allow people to reflect in a better way. I'm just scrolling for this uh, poem as you're talking. So keep talking and I'll hopefully find us. So, well, and, you know, and I feel very blessed because um, my father was a POW in World War II and he he left us to learn how to just have debates at the dinner table. And at my dinner table today, not today, but at Thanksgiving, I had Democrats, Republicans, progressives, libertarians, everybody, because in my family, I guess, you know, we don't all think the same way in my family. And we had a great meal and discussion and enjoyment. But I think this question that was sent in by one of our uh, participants uh, that's watching is a really important one because it uses the kind of language that I think we have to work against. Um, as a social justice Christian, I am appalled by the rhetoric and positions of Christian nationalism. How do we come together in a way that Gary's recommending? Okay. So how do we come together in the rhetoric? You've got to ask what's people have emailed me. I mean, particularly North Georgia, I do a lot of work there. I work with, I think during COVID when we were all locked into these little rooms of ours, I facilitated about 150, 160 clergy and conversations. And they said, Gary, you can't mention Biden in the pool, but you can't mention Trump. You can't mention Clinton. I said, don't mention them. Because you start personalizing this and assassinating people, people take sides. So I actually did this for the first time and forgive me, I don't think I told this the last time I was in the Carter Center. I, I alluded to it slightly. So I was speaking in a church in Georgia, March last year, and I asked them a question, uh, both Republicans and Democrats. I said, tell me this here. Had any person in this church a relative that fought in the Second World War? So hands went up everywhere. Uh, so my, 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 my aunt was there, my uncle, my grandfather, et cetera, et cetera. I said, let me tell you my uh, Second World War story. Uh, my uncle Jimmy uh, was pushed into the English Channel by the Nazis at Dunkirk. And I said, who's seen the movie Dunkirk? So again, lots of hands and up. So people were come. I suppose really more than this chat. I was trying to create what I call a moral framework for Republicans and Democrats to hear each other. So that was my modeling in relation mm -hmm. to that. I said, so my uncle Jimmy uh, was rescued. He was a brilliant swimmer. In fact, he taught me to swim as a little boy. I said, I did his funeral at the age of 82. And he went in again on the second day of D-Day. And I said, tell me who's seen Saving Private Ryan. And again, many hands went up. And I said, look, maybe my uncle Jimmy may have fought alongside some of your relatives because the Allied forces went in together. I said, I'm really proud of what he did, as I know you are. I said, I want to address something that may be difficult for some people in this room. I want to talk about January the 6th. And I want to say to you in this room tonight, if you are a Republican, you have a right to peaceful protest. That's what democracies are about. That's what Rashad and Martha and many other people here are trying to say. We need to keep our democracy. We don't want communism. We don't want dictatorship. We want to live in the free world. I said, my main difficulty with January the 6th was this. I saw a person with a Camp Auschwitz t-shirt. I also saw a person that had a t-shirt on, which a lot of people didn't notice, that said 6MNE, which meant 6 million Jews were not enough. Mm. And I said this categorically, Martha, your grandfather, my uncle Jim, and I said to all those people in the church, I say this unashamedly, 
that those great American forces and those British forces and Canadian forces did not shed their blood on the fields of Normandy, France, Belgium, Holland and Germany for someone standing outside the largest democracy on planet Earth to be calling for another Holocaust. Because that calls into shame your grandfather, my uncle and every one's person. So we need to call that out. And I call out unashamedly, unashamedly. Because that's America stands for democracy. That's why it defeated Nazism in the first place. And God forbid, if it hadn't defeated Nazism, where would we all be tonight? So we need to call out those things if we believe they are wrong. And that's why when I eventually pass on planet Earth and Rashad and Martha, I'm assuming, let's assume we all die on the same day. Rashad, you look a bit younger than me, so I'm not uh, I'm not uh, predicting your age or that. I can Google it later if I want to, but <laughs> I know this. Martha, Rashad and Gary will not be saying, I'm so glad I live my life as a Republican or a Democrat or a British Unionist or an Irish Nationalist. I'm glad I live my life according to eternal principles. Mm -hmm. And when I eventually go to heaven, God's not going to say to me, welcome home, British Unionist Gary, or welcome home, uh, great Georgia Republican Martha, or welcome home, great liberal Democrat Rashad. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant, for other things, things that last forever. So prioritize what's important. So I think they said there's one more question and I do want to read this poem if I can as well, but let's do a question and I'll do this poem. It's really tiny anyway. <laughs> All right, that, that, that was very powerful. Uh, and this will be um, the last of the Q&A. So okay. everyone, it's something very powerful, uh, but it's still internal to the church, uh, Reverend Mason, when we talk about how do we lead each other, basically. People that have a value system contextualized. Yeah. However, some of the biggest challenges uh, in particular within American democracy, that it, it is not only, there's room and leadership with people who do not have a faith at all. Uh, and that's perfectly okay in the confines of our government and democracy. So the question is, how do we communicate this message, the message you share, with a person or, or a people who do not have a faith? Yeah. Great question. And, you know, again, Rashad, it's a question of language. So I often say to my atheist friends, I call, I want to exercise grace to a person because God's exercised grace to me. Mm -hmm. You may call it generosity. The word kindness is a shared word across. It's not necessarily, it's, it's, a, it's a biblical word, but it's a word that most people I know of no faith are saying, look, I want to be a gentle, kind person. I don't want to be an abrasive person. So it's actually trying to look for those things that bring us together. I mean, in our space, I mean, the, the debate over Brexit, Northern Ireland protocols, border polls goes on and on and on. I'm facilitating a dialogue next week of 80 people across the island of Ireland, and I'm calling it the future as I see it. And I'm going to get diverse views, but the views, I'm asking people, just hear the other person's heart. And ask the question, if you'd have been born in their space, how would you think? Mm. How would you think? Let me just read this poem because I think it's profound. It's a, it's a little bit blurry, having taken on an iPhone. But here's, a, here's what it says. From the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard. But doubts... And loves dig up the world like a mole, a plow. And a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. Mm -hmm. That's the last exhibit in Yitchak Rabin's museum. A man who knew the cost of war, death, pain, in a way that most of us, including myself, do not know. But he realized that Palestinians... And the Israelis aren't going anywhere. Uh, Republicans and Democrats aren't going anywhere. There's no room for you in the United Ireland. There's far too many of you. We couldn't cope with 340 million people coming here. And in the same way, British Protestants and Irish Catholics are not going anywhere. So you either share the space in a way that allows humanity, and for those who choose faith to survive, or you absolutely descend into hell. And my prayer is that people like yourselves and other faith leaders, and I also would say reach out to those in the extremes. 
one of the keys to our peace processes. And the US government was brilliant at this in our space, was bringing in the hard extremes and facilitating uncomfortable conversations. So very well said. Um, I want to extend a personal and a collective thank you, uh, Reverend Mason, for your great presentation and your continued work in this arena. Uh, we know that everyone is a combination of three E's, experiences, exposures, and environment. We want to transform who we are or challenge how we grow. We have to also change our experiences, exposures, and environment in a way. As individuals, uh, we can be more aware of how we ourselves respond to polar, uh, polarization. Uh, it is uh, continuing to permeate in our political class, obviously. It creates negative emotions. It creates negative circumstances and negative outcomes. Uh, can I trust my information sources? Of the question. Where can I find trusted information is a question. Uh, we know that the most trusted people in the US, this is based on stats, all right? Firemen, all right? Followed by our friends and neighbors. We can talk to our friends, model respectful disagreement in our community and show acceptance of people with different views being people that deserve our love still our compassion they are children of god you want to take more action I'm talking to the crowd in general here if you want to take more action in your community bridge building within your community between various groups a number of groups that specialize in teaching skills to depolarize in religious settings, such as Braver Angels and the One America Movement. Put a couple up on. We also want to invite you to join our Democracy Resilience Networks in Florida, Georgia, Arizona, North Carolina, or to get on our list for further events like this. You could send an email to my colleague, Crystal Bowie, at drninfo at cartercenter.org. If you have any feedback for us, we'll be sending uh, a two minute survey to the participants that will help us in our work. But finally, we just wanna take a moment to say how appreciative we all are at the Carter Center for the thousands of well wishes that have come in since, since President Carter decided to go into hospice. It means so much to the President Carter and his family if any of you listening today want to send a message to President Carter and his family, you can do so by going to cartercenter.org. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Gary and Rashad. Um, this is a discussion that we start here, but we will finish along the way. Thank you. Best wishes, everyone.